Welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Hall Behrens, Director of Congregational Life at Westminster. We're so glad that you've joined us for today's presentation in our Broadening Horizons speaker series. This week I'm excited to be able to do a bit of time travel and to explore the depths of the ocean through the ages. A quick housekeeping note, after the formal part of today's presentation, there will be time for questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A written features to write um, the, your questions for us in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Um, also, it, we ask that you not record or take screenshots of the presentation because this is being recorded and you'll be able to view it again on the Westminster YouTube channel um, and can share with your friends in that way. Um, our opening prayer today is taken from the popular hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, whose text expands on the line in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Let us pray. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. God gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell. How great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. Amen. And Cindy Smith, now chair of the Congregational Life Committee, will introduce today's speaker, who also happens to be her friend. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted today to welcome my friend and neighbor, Mark Yoon. Mark is an associate professor of geology at George Mason University, and also serves as the associate chair of the Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Earth Sciences. Today, Mark will guide us through 52 million years of whale transitions in about 50 minutes, from their origins as land to sea animals. We'll learn about the modern evolution of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Forgive me for saying this, but it should be a whale of a tail. And now I'd like to turn this over to Mark. Mark? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so indeed, I work at George Mason and have been a vertebrate paleontologist for many years and have studied uh, whale evolution along with other marine mammals and other lots of other stuff, but these are my favorite. So hopefully I'll be able to convey the sort of uh, current state of our knowledge about where we think whales originated and where they came from and how they got from living on land to living in the sea. So today there's two kinds of whales. The mysticetes on the left here are in blue. They're the big, the ones you really think of when you hear whale. They're the filter feeders and they lack teeth and have this soft tissue structure called baleen that they use to filter tiny organisms from the seawater that they feed on. They tend to be really large, although there's not very many of them. There's only seven living genera and 102 known fossil genera. So genus is sort of like the next step up from species. And then over here, we have the odontocetes in red, shown here by a killer whale. Um, they, these guys are more diverse. There are many more living genera and fossil genera. And these guys, for the most part, retain teeth and feed on individual prey items like fish or squid. And they also use echolocation. So they send out high frequency sound pulses that they listen to the echoes to, to help find their prey. And together, these two, Mysticidae and Odontocidae, are part of this group called Neocidae, which just means the new whales. So they're the ones that are still around today. Uh, but in the fossil record, we see this group that we call Archaeocetes, and that just means the ancient whales. And uh, there are several families here, five families. There are no living species, but we do think that the Archaeocetes give rise to the Neocede. So, so in, a, in a sense, they're still with us, but they're not with us like you see here. And we know more and more about these, like every month, there's some new insights, some new fossils on these guys. Again, we think that they're uh, ancestral to modern whales. So I'm going to start with these early ones and then bring you up to the origins of modern whales and then, then bring you up to the present. So uh, the first thing we should get out of the way is whales are mammals, right? And we've known this for a long time. They are warm blooded, they nurse their young, they give birth to live young. So they have all, almost all the features we normally associate with mammals. They're generally hairless, but we can find uh, small numbers of hairs, like, like uh, a lot of mysticetes tend to have little, little mustache hairs, like just a few of them, especially when they're young. 
So they still have a few hairs here and there, but they, you know, not, they're not furry like mammals are today. But instead, they have a big layer of blubber underneath their skin that helps keep them warm in the ocean. So the next question, which, which puzzled scientists for a long time, is what group of mammals are they related to or part of? And um, in the past 20 years or so, we've come to the conclusion that whales are artiodactyls, and those are the cloven hooved ungulates. So you see a picture here of, I think it's a cow hoof. I forget what picture I grabbed, but those two hooves are actually two toes. And all the artiodactyls, which are shown in green and blue on this diagram are uh, hooved animals with an even number of toes. And you might say, well, whales don't have toes. They don't even have hind legs, which is true. But I'll show you that we now have fossils of animals that do have toes and show they have the same structure in their ankle and foot as all the rest of the artiodactyls. And within there, whales are most closely related to hippos, which is quite intriguing. But um, that basically every analysis we've done in the past 20 years has shown this relationship. And uh, it's, it's supported by the, the shape of modern animal bones, by the fossil animal bones, and also by genetics. So here, uh, we're going way back in the fossil record to the early Eocene, um, which is about 55 million years ago, 52 million years ago. And this uh, animal called Indohyus lived in Asia. And it's part of a group called the Rauwelidae. And these, these animals are terrestrial. We, we can see there's a skeleton here and then a reconstruction and some pictures of the bones. They have adaptations to walking on land, which isn't surprising because it's an artiodactyl. Most artiodactyls walk on land. But the reason we think it's related to whales, there's two of them. If you look on the right, there's a picture of some of the bones in cross section, and they're really thick. And thick bones are a feature of early whales, and it's thought to help weigh them down in the water, which is why in the reconstruction, you see the little guy walking on the bottom of the water. And they also have um, teeth that look like their terrestrial relatives, but they have ears that are clearly adapted to hearing underwater, which is also some of the indicators we see in early whales. So we think that the Rauwelids, so Indohyus and its relatives, are the terrestrial relatives of whales because they have whale-like ears and these thickened bones. And so, those are, those are the non-whales I'm going to talk about. And I want to talk about how whales transitioned from living on land to living in the water uh, in three phases. And this is just my construct. So first, the first transitional phase is the, the, the big one, like moving from living on land to living in the water. The second phase is the early diversification of the modern groups. And then the last phase is the origin of, of the whales we know and love today. So we're going to start with, the, you know, in the early phase at phase one and first talk about that terrestrial to aquatic transition. So I'm going to help illustrate this with a series of maps. So these maps show, pardon me, the, the position of the continents, which is different. It's, they're almost like today, but not quite. And that has a significant impact on how the Earth's climate uh, is distributed over the planet. So in the Eocene, there's a couple of major differences. One, there's a seaway between North and South America. India has not, India has moved north for a long time, but has not quite collided with Asia. So it's perhaps an island continent at the time. Maybe it's a little connected to Africa here. But there's all these red arrows show that there's basically a way for water to move quasi equatorially, maybe a little to the north of the equator around the whole planet. And that's not true today. And South America is connected to Antarctica and Australia is connected to Antarctica. And notice I put palm trees everywhere because in this time, the Earth's climate is what we call equable. It's, there's less of a difference between the poles and the equator. And in fact, we have good evidence of subtropical vegetation and animals all the way up here in Nunavut in Northern Canada. And so we think the world was generally warmer but also, more importantly, less different between the poles and the equator. So it's kind of 
Floridian everywhere. So that, that's a good way to think about it. And if you look here, these uh, orange triangles represent the very earliest whales. And the earliest ones we know of are from India and Pakistan in this area. So they're part of this, this marginal seaway here, this little seaway. And they look like this. This is one of the very earliest whales called Pachycetus, named after Pakistan, where it was first found. And these are two different reconstructions of it. My colleague Hans Tavison thinks of it more terrestrially and walking around. And my colleague Phil Gingrich thinks of it more as an aquatic animal. But if you really, if you think about it, they're just posed differently. If you just look at them closely, they're, they're two different reconstructions, but they have basically the same structure. Just one is shown walking and one is shown swimming. We think they did both. So one is just trying to emphasize terrestriality. The other one's trying to emphasize swimming. The things that are different about it versus Indohias is it's got a longer snout. So if you look at, think about whales, they have a very long snout. And that's true of a lot of things that eat prey in aquatic environments. And these are no different. They also have more whale-like ears and these dense bones like we saw in Indohias as well. Here's a little close-up of the skull and a jaw. You can't really see it here, but I can that, that they have an ear that is somewhat more like modern whales. It's definitely different from artiodactyls. Uh, and I'll show you more details of the ears in the future. Here's the lower jaw. They have these pointy teeth up front and that jaw is elongate. So the triangular teeth here and then smaller subtriangular teeth here. And we have much of the skeleton, um, skull, jaws, ears, limbs, and vertebrae. So we, we know about its locomotor capabilities, how it could move around. So we know it could walk just fine and we know it could swim in the water, which is no surprise because basically if you take any mammal and toss it in the water, it will, it'll swim, it'll dog paddle. So the sort of next, uh, this is maybe two million years later, we have this thing called Ambulocetus, which means the walking whale. It's actually named, the full name is Ambulocetus natans, which means the walking swimming whale. So again, we think it did both. Um, and we're getting more elongation of the snout. Notice the eyes are very high up on the head. So perhaps it was sitting in the water with the eyes out like a mammalian crocodile maybe. Um, uh, but again, it's getting uh, more aquatic, but it's still got really big hind limbs. It's got really big hind limbs and feet. So we think that those hind limbs and those big feet were used in swimming. So it might have been paddling alternately with, with its hind legs, sort of paddling more like a beaver or an otter. And we're still in Pakistan there. So by the middle Eocene, the world is uh, about the same. But notice I got lots more X's and dots on, on, my, on my graph here. So we still have whales in Indo-Pakistan. We got them in Egypt, North Africa, Europe, North America, and even here in um, Peru. And uh, this is down in New Zealand. And so whales originate here, but they spread rapidly through what would be, will become the Mediterranean. Uh, a lot of this part of Europe is underwater, so they get up here and they spread to North America. And we think, well, I think, I disagree. Some of my colleagues think whales came across like this. I think they came to North America and then to South America. I don't know how they got to New Zealand. They could have taken this route, they could have taken this route, but we don't have anything in the Indian Ocean uh, outside of Indo-Pakistan. So we don't know if they came this way or this way, but they got to New Zealand uh, by the middle Eocene, so about 40 million years ago. Now, uh, a new group of whales originated from those older groups, and this one is quite diverse. It's called the Protocetidae, and uh, this is an example of one called Rhodocetus, again from Pakistan. And uh, you see this, the snout has gotten longer, the nose has retracted somewhat up the head. So in a modern dolphin, it's way up here, the, the nares or the, the nose hole. Here it's about halfway up the skull. And this is the we have most of the skeleton, we do not have the tail, which is really kind of a shame because whale tails are very special. I'll talk more about them in a minute. We're not quite sure what this tail looked like, but we have other uh, examples of these vertebrae and we think that this is a, a proper reconstruction. And if you think about a whale today, it has these, these soft tissue structures called flukes that they used to swim. 
And we think these guys lacked them or had very, very little broadening of the tail. What's happening now is unlike Ambulocetus, this leg is somewhat smaller than the forelimb. So the, the leg is starting to get a bit smaller here. And in fact, we'll see the legs get smaller and disappear in almost entirely uh, over time. And so this group of whales spreads out from North Africa across the Atlantic. It gets to uh, Western South America as well. So, so they probably had habits kind of like a sea lion. And so think of them in the water most of the time feeding and doing their stuff and probably coming out to breed and have their young. And we actually have evidence of that, um, which I'll tell you about in a sec. So here's some more details about Rhodocetus. We have the skull, here's the, the, the nares. I know you can't see my cursor, sorry. Uh, lower jaw, pelvis and femur. And it was found articulated. That's what the lower left figure is. So this, we know how these bones fit together because we know anatomy, but also because we found it as it died, basically. And those are the hands and the feet of this animal. And uh, you can see them re-articulated separate from the rock on the right. And in the foot, there's a very special bone in the ankle called the astragalus, which is sort of up at the top. And that bone has a very special shape. And only artiodactyls have that shape. And um, wouldn't you know, this was the first whale astragalus we ever found, and it is shaped just like artiodactyls. So we had suspicions that whales were related to artiodactyls, but this, not, not just as one fossil, we have others, but this is the first one that showed a complete ankle and that bone just like terrestrial artiodactyls. So this plus the genetics is what convinced everybody, basically, modern biologists and paleontologists that these were indeed artiodactyls. Here's a generalized protoceded skeleton. You can see the, the features that it has. And so one of the, one of the things they have are these uh, vertebrae in the back where it says partially unfused sacrum. The sacrum are where vertebrae are fused together and then attached to the pelvis. And in early whales, they have three or four vertebrae fused together into a very solid sacrum that then attaches to the pelvis. And that supports a hind limb for walking. And over the course of time, protocetids disarticulate those vertebrae. So they drop one off the back, another one, another one, until they get down to just one, and then eventually zero. So that's, that's part, how, partly how their back becomes more flexible over time when it started out quite stiff. And they have a big fat tail, it says robust tail there. Um, and you'll see this is going to be quite different in the next group of organisms I'm going to show you. And this figure is from a book that I wrote with my friends, uh, Felix Marx and Olivier Lambert. And uh, I'm not going to terribly plug my book, but if you're really interested in this topic, you can buy it at Amazon. It's called Cetacean Paleobiology. Okay, so by the late Eocene, uh, things are starting to change here. Not a whole lot, but uh, we still have the, the seaway through here, although India keeps creeping north, if you've been paying attention. Um, by the late Eocene, notice all the dots are the same color. They're all yellow. That's because all the whales I've talked about so far went extinct. And the only thing left is this family, the Basilosauridae, which is the yellow dots. But we have them in basically the same places we had other stuff before. So let's look at the basilosaurids. So these are my favorite. Uh, I, I did my doctoral dissertation on Dorodon here. And notice now we have some really dramatic anatomical differences. The, the back is really long. We got a lot more vertebrae in the back. The tail is different. You can see we reconstructed with flukes, which I'll show you why in just a sec. And those little bones underneath the back end there are the hind limb. So it's detached from the vertebral column and it's really teeny tiny. And we think it's stuck out. There's still, on the reconstruction, you can see the little hind legs, but, but it's clearly not for walking. And if it did anything, it might've been used for copulation. So lining up in the water for the males and females to be able to mate. So here's the skull. Uh, notice the, the nose is moving backwards. Um, the teeth are more elaborate here. And um, if you look, you can see the elaborations of the teeth uh, in the lateral view there. So in Pachycetus, they were just sort of triangles. Now these triangles have little bumps all over them. 
which we think are better to grip prey. And the teeth have simplified into blades that cut past one another. So we think these animals use their teeth to chew food, which uh, we can tell by looking at the wear on the teeth. And that's different from modern whales. Modern whales don't chew their food. They just grab and swallow. And so uh, these guys still chew their food, which is uh, the last time we're going to see that in this fossil record. Now, we know a lot about Dorodon because we have, uh, it's best known from Egypt, uh, west of Cairo in the desert. And we have many, many specimens, and a lot of them there are juveniles. And if um, there was a show called um, When Whales Walked that was on last June that featured these guys. And, uh, and there was another one called Walking with uh, Beasts a couple of years ago from Discovery Channel, where they showed uh, bigger whales preying on the juveniles of Dorodon. And that almost certainly did happen. We have direct evidence of that. And so we think this area might have been a, a, a nursery for these little guys. And what's great about that is we can learn about them and their development, how they grew from a newborn to an adult. And one way we do that with mammals is like all mammals, well, almost all mammals erupt two sets of teeth, just like that. So they have baby teeth and adult teeth. And this specimen in the lower left is a maxilla, so it, it's the upper jawbone of a juvenile Dorodon. And what it's showing is the three teeth in the middle are baby teeth and they're fully erupted. And there's a new adult tooth just barely popping up in the back. And there's the last baby tooth way in the front. There's a little brown triangle. It's the last baby tooth erupting. So we can work out the dental eruption sequence of these guys, which tells us about how fast they grew up. And they grew up moderately fast, faster than modern whales. And uh, that's interesting because today, whale babies grow up slowly rather like human babies because their parents teach them things. And there's actually been a really good demonstration in modern uh, dolphins and their relatives that they do actually have a culture of their own and they learn things and they can teach those skills to their young. Uh, on the right, you see bits of the ear, the middle ear bones on the top and the cochlea on the bottom. The middle ear bones translate uh, pressure in water, which is sound, uh, into the cochlea, which is an open space filled with fluid. And it's inside the cochlea that that, that mechanical energy that is sound is turned into nerve impulses. And by studying the cochlea, we can, we can tell what frequencies, at least to a first approximation, what frequencies they could hear. And they appear to have a frequency range like that of modern mysticity, so the big whales. And that suggests they don't echolocate because you have to be able to hear high frequency sound to, eff to efficiently echolocate. And so we think these guys don't echolocate, and that's a feature that evolves later in the toothed whales. Okay, I promised to tell you about the tail. Uh, if you look in the upper left, you see the tail of a dolphin called Stenella. That's a modern dolphin. And look how the vertebrae get narrower and narrower, and then they get really flat and wide. And that right there, where they make that shape transition from sort of long to flat and wide, is where the soft tissue flukes attach to the vertebral column. And you can see a similar shape transition in Dorodon, where they, they get flatter and wider. And so we think because we see this similar shape transition, these guys probably had flukes. Um, we don't have a pelvis of Dorodon, but we'd have one from this related animal called Chrysocetus, which is shown in the upper right. And that scale bar at the bottom, those are centimeters. So this is teeny, it's like this big. Uh, on an animal, that was probably five meters long. And so again, we have elements of the hindland, but they're really small. And in the bottom right, you see the femur on the left, the patella in the middle, and the astragalus on the right. So the patella is a kneecap. That's the, your kneecap. This is a whale kneecap, probably the first time and probably last time you'll see a whale kneecap right there. But again, we know they have the hindlands because we have the bones of them. They're just super small. 
So here is a reconstruction of the skeleton of, of Dorodon as an example of Basilosaurus or Basilosaurids. There's a bunch of these. Uh, and again, they live all over the world. The, the new features we see here is their necks are shorter. So whales have very short necks. Modern whales have very short necks. Some so short, they fuse the vertebrae together. They have a really long torso by the addition of uh, more vertebrae there. They started out with six lumbar vertebrae. They end up with 20. So that's a lot more teeny tiny legs, uh, but probably still projected under the body cavity. And they have um, evidence in the tail that they had flukes. So they abandon any limb-based propulsion and instead use their tail to move them through the water. Okay, just to pause for a sec. So far we've gone from the, the, the we're going to look at, we've done the green. So we, we, we've gone from Pachycetus to Ambulocetus, Rhodocetus, and Dorodon. And we think something like Dorodon gave rise to all modern whales. So the Neocetes. So we're going to follow, I think we're going to follow the Mysticetes first and from, from the end of the Eocene to the recent, and then we'll follow the Odontocete curve. So we're going to have to break our discussion into two for the rest of the talk. So it's really important, uh, this transition at the end of the Eocene, at the beginning of the Oligocene, it's marked by a major transition in the Earth's climate. And it's caused by the fact that, well, India collides with Asia, but more importantly, South America and Antarctica split apart and Australia and Antarctica split apart. And what that does is it allows a current to, so Antarctica is basically sitting on the South Pole and it's kind of circular and it allows a current to just start flowing around Antarctica, cleverly called the Circum-Antarctic Current, and it isolates Antarctica from the rest of the world. So most of the solar radiation on the planet hits near the equator and ocean currents transport it towards the poles. But this current, the Circum-Antarctic Current, keeps the pole, at least the South Pole, isolated from that warm water and thus we get major glaciation at this time. So we get our, our polar ice caps form at this time. Before that, the world was ice free. And at the, after this, we get ice at the poles and that changes ocean currents, it changes climate, it changes the distribution of food resources in the ocean. So the world becomes really different. And so at this point we lose the basilosaurid archaeocetes and the, the uh, Odonocetes and Mysticetes originate, and I think that's significant because they feed very differently. And I think it's because the food resources got distributed differently on the planet. So now the dots are, are uh, blue for Mysticetes and red for Odonocetes. So here's what makes these guys different. So again, you see this comparison. The bones are shaded similarly. So Look at the odonocete there, it's retracted. The, the external nares is the nose hole and it's way at the top of the head. The nasal bones are, are very short and we get this um, elongation of the snout and a, and a pushing of the bones of the face basically get pushed up on top of the head and they take the nose with it. In mysticetes, uh, uh, the front of the skull is more like archaeocetes, but some of the back of the skull pushes forward and so, Again, this, this major reorganization of bones in the skull in both groups, but it happens in different ways in each group. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between them and between them and our, the RTC ancestors. So now let's focus on baleen whales for a little bit. So again, this is how they feed in modern environments. Things like right whales are shown in figure A. They do what's called skimming. They, they swim around with their mouth open and water goes in a gap at the front of their mouth where there's no baleen and it flows out the sides through the baleen. So water and food comes in, flows out the side and they literally just plow through the food eating it. Uh, B shows how the balenopterids feed. So these are the big ones like, like blue whales and say whales uh, do this. Uh, they, they have a big throat pouch shown by those grooves and what they do is they swim really fast with their mouth open at a patch of food and water, scoop it up, and that throat pouch expands greatly. And then they close their mouth, they, they almost close their mouth, squeeze the throat pouch, pushing the water out through the baleen, and the food gets caught on the inside of the baleen. And finally, gray whales are shown in C doing something 
seems really unusual. What they do is they ram their head into the sediment at the bottom of the ocean. They're like, why would they do that? Well, lots of things live in that sediment. So they scoop up the sediment water plus food and they sort of suspend the sediment in the water, squeeze it out the baleen, and most of the sediment goes out with the water and the food is trapped in their mouth. And you can actually, this has been shown, you can see in aerial photos, these gouges in the bottom where they do this. So potentially this feeding behavior could be documented in the fossil record if we found those gouges, but no one's recognized it so far. Uh, okay, so, so a quick look here are the archaeocetes down here in green, odonocetes in red, and there's this early diversification in yellow here of really weird feeding behavior in these whales. So they don't immediately go from feeding like an archaeocete to feeding like modern mysticetes. They, they sort of seem to be experimenting, and this, this figure is, it's 10 years old, and in fact, we got even more weird feeding modes in these early guys. Some look like sea lions, some uh, look kind of like archaeocetes, and they have teeth, you know, because they're from two ancestors. Actually, still have teeth, and still not 100% clear how they evolved. So here's an example. Yanacetus is one of the very earliest mysticetes, and the, the tooth on the right is a tooth of Yanacetus being compared to a leopard seal tooth. And some people thought, well, you know, like crab eater seals and leopard seals sort of feed kind of like mysticetes, but they use their teeth to do it. And maybe Yanacetus does the same thing, but they're really not particularly similar. And their tooth are, teeth are too widely spaced to be effective uh, filters for krill, if you will. So it's not really clear what Yanacetus is doing, but it's a really big animal from Antarctica. There's some relatives of it in New Zealand. Don't know what it was doing with those teeth, but probably not filter feeding. Uh, here's one that's, if you look at that skull, I mean, the thing it overall looks most like is a sea lion. Lots of teeth, teeth like a sea lion, big eyes, which Mr. Seats generally don't have. Uh, and it was probably feeding like a sea lion. So sea lion head and a whale body. Uh, there are other features which clearly ally it with mysticetes, and it's in this family called uh, Mamelodontidae, uh, known only from New Zealand and Australia. So again, not at a first glance, you'd think it was a mysticete, but it, but it is. Uh, Ediacetids have smaller teeth and uh, more broad, flat skulls like a modern mysticete. So some people suggested based on other features that maybe they had teeth plus baleen. That idea has fallen out of favor with my research group, although these guys still like it. So we're having a friendly scientific debate. Uh, what I think my team is going to win this debate. So uh, again, I would not reconstruct it with baleen, but it was probably eating schooling fish. That may have been a way to transition into um, filter feeding by eating, you, to, to filter feed effectively, you need food concentrated in batches. So eating small schooling fish may have been a way to transition from eating individual fish, small schooling fish to what they eat now, which is mainly things like copepods and krill. Um, this is the, what they said. They said there are these little grooves. The arrows point to these little grooves and holes, uh, which on the right in Bilinoptera have blood vessels that grow to the baleen. The, there are similarly placed grooves and holes in Ediacetus. However, my student, my former student, Carlos Pareto and I were able to demonstrate that, in fact, you can find these in Odonis seats, you can find them in Archae seats, you can find them in terrestrial Artiodactyls. So they're unlikely to be associated with baleen, but rather just with the gums in general. So it was a good idea. I don't think it's right. Uh, and this is the nature of science, right? We, we make hypotheses based on the data in front of us, collect more data and correct where necessary. Uh, this is an animal called Maya Balina nesbiti, which again, described with my student, Carlos Pareto. It's a specimen from the Smithsonian, but it was collected in the North Pacific. And this animal, we think, had no teeth and no baleen, but rather suction fed, it actually sucked things into its mouth and just swallowed them whole. So we think that may be a transitional phase between uh, using the teeth to feed and using baleen to feed. So, um, 
lots of ideas here. Like I said, this just sort of shows all the, the wacky things we think people, or sorry, different whales were doing. Suction feeding on the bottom. Uh, raptorial feeding just means grabbing prey with your teeth and eating it. Uh, raptorial suction feeding, maybe just suction feeding. And, and only later do we get the lean and all these other feeding modes uh, fall to the wayside. So this is our idea of how things worked. Um, we, we prefer, the, these are all the different ideas of how baleen originated. We prefer D, we have whales with gums basically, no baleen, no uh, teeth. And that after that, then we develop baleen. So I have, to, I have to pick up the pace just a little bit, I'm a little behind here. So now we, we looked at mysticetes, now we're gonna look at the odonocetes and see where they come from. So um, odonocetes, like I said, echolocate. They produce sounds in their blowhole, basically, just, just down to their blowhole. The sounds go out this soft tissue structure called the melon, which is effectively a lens for the outgoing sound waves. And it helps them to focus the beam. Then it comes back, actually hits their jaw and hits that fat pad, which is tucked in right next to the ear. So it, that helps sound get back into the ear, then they, they use that to create a picture of their world. Um, this, is, this makes sense because light doesn't penetrate water very well, especially if it's murky. Um, and then this allows them to perceive their environment um, very accurately without having to see it with their eyes. So um, in the yellow here, this, this is a little science here, sorry. Uh, this is from a paper that I wrote. All the yellow stuff, what we call stem taxa. So these are the the odontocetes that have no living representatives, except you see the living guys come out here, um, sort of at the bottom of that yellow block. So there's a lot of diversity early on, but the interesting, excuse me, the interesting thing is that uh, in the, in the mysticetes, we have things that look a lot like archaeocetes, but they have some features of mysticetes. The odontocetes aren't like that. We just, they look like odontocetes from the get go. They look like primitive odonocetes, but there's not this, we don't have a lot of transitional forms uh, between archaeocetes and these guys. I think they're in this other hemisphere somewhere. We just haven't found them yet. Um, but these are some interesting ones. So on the left is this thing called Albertocetus that I described a few years back. It's part of the very earliest radiation of odontocetes. Um, and that one's from North Carolina. They're very well represented in the Carolinas. Um, Cymocetus on the other side is very similar, but we put them in a different family. That's from the Pacific Northwest. And again, there's features of both these guys that we can see that they could both create high frequency sounds. There's, there's features of their face that show they had um, the air sacs and the melon uh, to help the outgoing sound. And if you look at their ears, they could definitely perceive high frequency sounds. They, could, they, they have both elements of the echolocation system from the get-go. Now this shouldn't be too big a surprise because basically it's been shown that all mammals can echolocate. I don't know if you've ever seen this, there are videos um, and, and scientific descriptions of blind humans who as children learn to make clicks and they can actually echolocate as a hum humans can do this. And uh, that's amazing, but it, so it, it seems like Mammals inherently have the equipment to do a basic job of echolocation. Odonocetes and the other group that does this really well are bats. They really amplify that system. Um, so there's this family called the Agorophiidae, also known from the Carolinas. Uh, you know, the, you, you can see, I'm gonna back up, uh, in the lower left, you can see the, the, the nose moving back towards the top of the skull. It's not quite all the way there, but again, these, uh, have little teeth. You can see in uh, figure E, I think, that they look a little like RPC teeth, um, but they're different from modern toothed whales, which basically just have pegs. So there's this group of stem whales, stem odonocetes, that have uh, little triangular teeth with multiple roots, and then they simplify to single roots as we get towards the recent. Uh, on the left here, we got um, the squalodontids. Uh, this is an example uh, called Squalodon from the Calvert Cliffs. If you've never been there, I highly recommend going to Calvert Cliffs State Park. You can collect fossils there. You mostly find shark's teeth, but you might find these. Um, 
Squalodon calvertensis, it's called, named after the, the county in the area. And they have rather archaeocete looking teeth, but their skulls are actually quite modern looking. Uh, on the other side, Wipatia there is from New Zealand and it has smaller teeth, but they're multi-rooted and multi-cusp. They have a nice long snout. With, and if you look at the reconstruction, you can see there's these, we call procumbent incisors. Their incisors stick out front and they, they may have been used for um, uh, intra-species interactions. So they may have groomed each other or fought each other with those teeth. But these stemodontocetes show up all over the world, different groups of them. So in the last phase of evolution here, I'll get to the recent. Um, so this, this reconstruction of the world is in the early Miocene uh, at a time when basically our modern climate system was in place. And we find them basically anywhere we find marine rocks, we find both mysticetes and odontocetes. That's why we see both groups there. Uh, I guess South Africa is the exception. Um, for some reason, the Indian Ocean does not have a lot of marine mammals today, and it doesn't have many marine mammal fossils at all in the past. So that, that's an interesting puzzle to be uh, pondered. Uh, this sort of shows, if you look at the top zero, that's today, those are all the different families of whales that um, are around today, and you can see how far back they go. So at the, at the beginning of the Miocene, we still have a lot of these old groups that I'm calling here the initial radiation. And then during the early and middle Miocene, we lose those, most of those, and then the new groups, the ones that are still around, radiate. So there's this sort of transition from the older forms to newer forms during the Miocene. And by the end of the Miocene, we basically have the modern fauna as well established, at least at the family and probably the genus level, although lots of species turn over in the last 5 million years. Now, um, just wanted to show this because it's super cool. Um, one of the places I've done field work is Peru. And baleen is a soft tissue structure. Like it's, it's like your fingernails. It's flexible but tough. Um, but we do actually have some fossilized baleen where that tissue got buried very early and, and got replaced by minerals. And that's what you see here. And uh, I was able to walk up, this is my photograph, that's my shadow over there on the right. Uh, and I could count how many plates, those are called baleen plates. I could count the number of plates in this animal that's, you know, 16 million years old. That's pretty crazy. And uh, we don't usually get that preservation, but it's really exquisite in this place. Although we have uh, good examples of the bones of these, even in Calvert Cliffs, uh, we think this animal had baleen. It has those grooves and foramina that I mentioned before, little holes to feed the gums that feed the baleen. And on the left is the fossil at Smithsonian, and the right is a drawing of it. Um, this is another one. This one's from California. Again, we have some really, really nice fossils, but that uh, preservation of baleen is extremely rare. Um, this is the, the, a very low diversity family that's kind of mysterious, but we have like two fossils of it. And the modern genus is called Caeparia. This is the Miocene version called Myo Caeparia. The only problem is this fossil is almost identical to the modern one. So it doesn't, doesn't illustrate a whole lot of change in this lineage. And here you go, these are the modern three families of modern mysticetes. Uh, the baleenids are the right whales and they're very, um, they're very endangered. So northern right whales are, are struck by ships crossing the Atlantic and there's not, there's hundreds of them left. Uh, Caeparia in, in the right is a representative of the neo baleenidae and it's just rare and only lives in the southern ocean. In fact, I think there's two skulls of it in the entire US. And then the balenopterids on the bottom include the blue whale, which is the largest animal ever to have lived. Bigger than any dinosaur, any plesiosaur, anything like that. And most of the modern baleen, baleen whales are baleen nids. And they're all very similar to one another, just different in size and uh, distribution. So the modern Odonisi arise in the Miocene. Um, there was a, there were, and I, I don't want to give this impression that there's this like linear progression from the start to now. There's a lot of diversity. I don't, like I said, I only have 50 minutes, so I, can, I can't tell you about everything. 
um, there's this whole radiation called the u delphinidae that had these really long rostrum and they were everywhere on the planet. They had hundreds of little teeth, very successful, lots of species, lots of specimens, they were everywhere. And then they just go extinct. And we think they might've been replaced by modern dolphins, which arose from this group called the Kentriodontidae. And Kentri down here uh, is described from the Calvary Cliffs. So it's from right down the street, basically here. Uh, again, lots of diversity. This is a porpoise from the Pliocene of California that had this weird projecting lower jaw. And uh, my colleague, Rachel Rassico, suggested maybe they were using it to stir up bottom fish like flounders and then grabbing them, maybe, maybe. But again, we know it's a porpoise, which is a pretty modern group, but it's a fossil representative that has a morphology we don't see in the modern. Uh, here's an early monodontid. Monodontids are the belugas and narwhals. Uh, and um, Ohaskaya here is from North Carolina. So right now, monodontids are restricted to the Arctic, but they, they had a broader distribution. In fact, we find some of them in like Baja, California. And so they, they are restricted. They are specialists in Arctic environments today, but they weren't always. Again, here are modern representatives of all the different groups, sperm whales, porpoises. Uh, there are several groups of river dolphins, which uh, were certainly derived from ocean going things. Platanista there is the Ganges river dolphin. And it was part of a radiation that again was broad and deep. You know, we had them all over the planet lots of diversity and they're just, just one left and it's in the Ganges and Indus and Brahmaputra rivers in India. Right now, dolphins represented by Delphinus here are the most diverse group living today. Uh, second only to the Zephyids shown here by Berardius, which is called a beaked whale. We don't know a lot about them because they live out in the open ocean. So we know more about dolphins because they often live near shore. Beaked whales eat squid and go deep diving way out in the ocean. So we don't know a lot about them, even though they're very diverse. Um, so again, this is just a quick overview of the entire fossil record of whales from the start to the end, showing how many different kinds there were over time. So we start out low, of course they start out just with just one, um, and then they peak in the middle Miocene. That's that, that time period where you have old stuff and more new stuff and we know what kind of world the, the whales like. They like it fair to midland temperature wise. Um, and uh, it, was, it was that during the middle Miocene. So that's where they show the most diversity. It's basically just been falling towards the recent. Um, and so, you know, people always wanna say, well, what's climate change gonna do to whales? It might actually make the world a little better, but again, I would hate to say that. And we have other, stressors on whales like chips and pollution and noise pollution. Uh, so there you go. Um, and I'll just let, let stop there and let you guys ask, answer questions or ask questions. That's great, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, we're really excited to have gone on this journey through time and space and the depths of the ocean and the right. depths of history. Um, and we appreciate you being with us today. You're we're welcome. grateful for you giving us a better understanding of some of the most fascinating creatures on earth. Um, I have to say, uh, well, if anybody would like to write a question down in the Q&A section, please do. We'll be taking written, written questions. I had um, one comment that, um, shout out to Patrick Honeycutt, who's our associate pastor, who's, who's in the audience today. And he, he echoed something that I was thinking of, what, whales started on, line, on land? Mind blown. Mm -hmm. um, and because I always think, when I think of evolution, I think of those diagrams showing sea creatures going up to land, and this yeah. is the opposite, so. Well, yeah, so this happens a lot. In fact, I've, I've got a paper in the works on, on how often things go back into the ocean, lots and lots and lots of times. And so, oh. yeah, so some, you know, way back in the day, vertebrates came out on land and then they've, they they keep going back to the ocean. And just within mammals, we got whales that did it, sea cows did it, and pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, and walruses kind, kind of, you know, are mostly back in the water, but they still come out <laughs> to have their babies. And there's a couple of fossil groups that we think were semi-aquatic as well. Wow, I guess as a French major, I should have taken a little more science and I might've learned that, but uh, it, you know, you just have this picture of 
sea to land. And, and so, this is just, yeah. wow. The other cool. part of the question was, what about Moby Dick? Well, Moby Dick actually yes. has a chapter called The Fossil Whale. I highly recommend reading it. Oh, mm -hmm. so is he favorably seen? And I mean, is Moby Dick? Well, uh, you know, he, it's a really interesting <laughs> book. He, he talks about natural history and history and just like the mechanics of whaling. He, he gets the fossil whale stuff okay for, for the time he was living. Uh, his taxonomy of whales, not so good. He calls them spouting fish, and they're not <laughs> fish, they're mammals. So. Oh, right, right. Other questions? Other questions. Um, okay, so this person um, is, would like to know um, how the mystocetes was able to maintain their mass by being filter feeders. Yeah, so mystocetes. Um, Sorry, mystocetes. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you think about this, the way that, that it's, this is a little technical, I'll try to explain. The way energy budgets work for organisms, the bigger you are, the smaller the amount of calories you need per unit mass to stay alive, right? So do blue whales eat a lot of food? Oh yeah, they eat a lot of food, but per unit mass, they need less food than the whales that are half their size. And wow. so if you have food that's really concentrated in different places around the planet, which is what happens because they go feed at the poles and they breed at the equator, being big is a huge advantage, right? You, you, mm. you still need a lot of food, but you eat less per unit. Well, it's like, it's like going on sale, right? You can get more for less. And that's basically what you do when you're big. Wow. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, so the source of all knowledge or not, uh, social media yesterday, there was something like International Whale Day or something. Oh, and I, I missed it. I don't know. <laughs> but it said something about, oh, orcas are in the dolphin family or they're, they're closer to dolphins than whales. So, uh -huh. but from what I was understanding here, I'm, so what makes a whale a whale, a dolphin a dolphin, a porpoise a porpoise, or are they yep. subsets? Of so, so those are English words, so they can mean whatever <laughs> English people speak English want them to mean. Um, when I say whale, I mean anything in the order cetacea. So any, anything I talked about today is a whale. Um, generally, when people say dolphin, they, they either mean a small toothed whale uh, or something in the family delphinidae. And so orcas are in the family delphinidae, but they're the biggest representatives of that group. So, so, you know, we call them killer whales. So they're both dolphins and whales. So these terms are quite flexible. So don't, uh, my only recommendation is don't get too hung up on it <laughs> about what, which is what. That's why we have scientific terminology. Uh, you know, we have scientific names that, so when a scientist talks to another scientist, they know exactly what they're saying because these yeah. English words have, have flexible meanings. Well, that's yep. interesting. Yes, yeah, so you have your own scientific language. As a, again, as a French major, uh, <laughs> we different languages yep. are important. So um, please feel we have a couple more minutes if anybody wants to ask any more questions. I have another one that is um, a little more signs of the times. So your particular field of teaching, how has that changed in having to do everything remotely now? Yeah, so we're doing, at George Mason, we're doing a mix. We're doing a hybrid model. So I'm I'm teaching vertebrate paleontology, so the fossil record of everything with the backbone. And I'm doing those lectures remotely, but my graduate student is teaching the lab portion and she opted to do that face-to-face. -face. So in our classroom, uh, you know, they have restrictions, uh, they wear masks, socially distance, it's cleaned. Students clean when they get in and they clean on their way out and the room gets cleaned twice a day. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, Mason has had a very limited number of co positive COVID tests. Um, really? You know, we, we, they monitor it daily. We, we, yeah, we monitor it daily. And Mason, I think, has been very progressive in that they gave instructors full control on whether they wanted to be in the classroom or not. I, okay. you know, my situation was I didn't feel like I wanted to do that. My grad student opted to do it. But I, every week when I meet with her, I say, if you don't want to do this anymore, we'll move you online so that if the situation changes or somebody gets sick. So I think we're, we're doing the best we can to get students the best education we can, given the circumstances. 
and the need to keep everyone safe. Thank you. That's interesting. We, I know we have a, at least one, maybe more uh, Westminster students at uh, George Mason and others of us have college students and of mm -hmm. course high school and below. And so that that's a big concern for a lot of us now and just thought I'd mm -hmm. hear from. Yeah. And I, I feel like everyone's doing their best, right? To, to, to teach and learn and do what we can in these times. And I, I, I feel for my elementary and middle school colleagues who uh, it, the attention span of college students is bad enough. I couldn't imagine doing it with young kids. So more power to them. Cindy, did you have anything you're on mute, but if you wanted to um, say anything else before we say goodbye, um, since Mark is your friend and neighbor. Well, I would certainly like love to thank him for spending this time with us today. And um, no, it was fascinating. It was really fascinating. I really enjoyed it. And I so hope everyone else did. When, when you get a chance, uh, when we can go back, there are some great fossil whales on display at Smithsonian. And if you're out by Mason, uh, we have one on display in Exploratory Hall. So come see them. And oh. I hope we can get back to that soon. But uh, yes. when, Outings. When, you yes. that, when you can do it safely, do that and go to Calvert Cliffs and find some cool fossils. Oh, yes, that would be great. I have been to Calvert Cliffs once, but I need to go back after this. That's very interesting. It, the park is open, but it gets crowded and they close it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I want to thank you again, Echo Cindy's thanks. And I also want to thank everyone who attended today or who are watching this at a later time because this is being recorded and people will be able to watch it later. Um, so watch your Westminster Weekly eGram for details of other upcoming webinars on our Broadening Horizons series and join us to make new discoveries and learn more about our world. And we appreciate learning about this particular underwater portion of, of the world where we usually can't go exploring ourselves. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I just want to end by saying, you know, may we protect God's good creation, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. So, Amen. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks. You too.